This is Transit Unplugged, and I'm your host, Paul Comfort. Today, I'm excited to bring you an interview with a new friend of mine, Wade Coombs. Wade is director of Strathcona County Transit in Strathcona County, Alberta, Canada. I recently met him at the Canadian Urban Transit Association annual conference in Western Canada and immediately liked him and asked him to sit down with me right then for this interview. He is an amazing guy with a heart that burns with passion to serve his community. He runs a mid-sized transit system in Western Canada and talks to us today about regionalization, working with other local transit systems for fare collection, etc. All the inside look at what it takes to make a transit system of his size run, I think you'll find Find this a fascinating interview from a great guy, Wade Coombs, on today's episode of Transit Unplugged. What does it mean to be a successful public transit agency? What are you doing to lead the way? It's time to learn from the top transit professionals in North America. This is Transit Unplugged with your host, Paul Comfort. Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort. I'm excited today to be at the Canadian Urban Transportation Association big conference in sunny, warm... Is it sunny and warm here? No. It's it's, it's getting warm. <laughs> yeah, Calgary, Canada. And there's a big crowd here, hundreds and hundreds of people. And uh, I wanted to bring to you Wade Combs, who is the CEO of Strathcona County. He's the director of the transit system there. Thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure, Paul. It's great to be here and meet you. Yeah, so Wade's a good listener to the podcast. And... Um, we started talking, and he's got a great story, and I thought I should bring it to our listeners around the world. Uh, Wade, tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up as the head of this transit system. Well, I've been in the industry for 32 years. I started uh, in Saskatoon. I, my first job was cleaning buses. I did that uh, for about a year. Then I moved in, and I was an uh, operator for almost 15 years driving. Um, Where at? Where were you driving? In Saskatoon. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my whole first 20 years of my career was in Saskatoon, driving, and I did the nights, the split shifts, the all everything. And uh, uh, I was fortunate. Uh, about after 15 years of doing that, I got an offer to uh, be the coordinator of customer service and marketing for the city of Saskatoon, uh, the transit department. I did that for about a year and a half, and then. Uh, I was asked uh, to move into operations manager and manage at the time. We had 186 operators and uh, 130 buses in the fleet and manage all of that and look after all that and uh, did that for a couple of years. And then uh, I got another offer. Uh, I was asked to come down to a smaller community, Lethbridge, Alberta, and uh, be their planning and scheduling manager. And so I moved down there. No real experience in planning or scheduling. And, uh, <laughs> I'm an ops guy. And, learned on and the that, job. Learned on the job. Uh, it was a great experience. I learned so much. Uh, I had a great manager there, John King, who taught me a lot and uh, did that for about five years. And then uh, I left the municipal side and the public sector and I went and worked uh, private contractor for about three years. I was up in Fort McMurray managing the uh, municipality's transit contract for a year and a half. And then from there, I moved into the oil sands and did uh, people transportation there. Uh, I did on-site service, and then I did some of the town-to-site uh, service and okay. transporting people. Did out that to the oil fields. Out to the oil fields, yeah. Okay, all yeah. the big three, Suncor, Syncruz, and Shell, had all three on contracts at one point that I had a portion that I was managing. And then uh, I was missing public transit, and an opportunity came up to take on uh, the role as director at Strathcona County Transit, which is just outside Edmonton, Alberta. And I applied for it, and I was successful, and so I've been there for four years now, and Loving it, it's been a great opportunity. That's great. What motivates you? Coming from your heart, when you and I were talking, I think you and I share a similar motivation, Wade. Tell us about the motivation to serve people through transit. Oh, I, I believe all along the time and uh, that, you know, I, my purpose here on earth is to serve people. Uh, I get my greatest pleasure when I'm involved with people, I'm helping people to achieve their best, whether it's working with my staff. I remember when I was in Saskatoon as operations manager and um, I had a friend who was a pastor and he, he, we were talking, the time he was talking about maybe getting in the ministry and he said, you don't need to, you got your own church here. And uh, it was true. I, I, I had the ability to serve those people and my, my mindset at the time was my goal is to make every operator the best operator they can be. And as long as they're willing to work with me, I'll work with them and we'll do whatever it is to get them there. And Because if they're in the best place and, and doing the best they can, then our customers are getting the best service. They're having a happy uh, experience and then it makes their life better. So it's all about serving people. 
and I bet you have a good relationship with your operators and your dispatchers and your mechanics, don't you? Personally. I believe I do. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Um, I can tell. You know, when you have a heart like that, I think yeah. they they sense that, that you're not there just to make a buck or to make your KPIs. You're there because you care about them as well as your passengers. I do. Yeah. I, you know, I, and I do. And then when I came into South Cone, even when I was up in uh, Fort McMurray and some of the sites I went into, there were there had been some cultural issues, some, some morale issues, and, and we did a lot of work in, in changing that around and, and looking at what, what was creating that. and. Uh, some of the cases, it was us against them. How do we get that out? How do we engage our employees? How do we give them an avenue to speak and be involved in decisions? And and one of the things we're doing right now is I'm a big Simon Sinek fan. And yes, the why. The why, so, that's right. I, you know, I, I talk to our leadership team and I say, we need to understand the why of everything we're doing. And our employees need to be able to ask that and we need to be able to answer that. That's beautiful. So in every communication we do, we used to do emails or our, our memos and it was always about the what and the when. Right. Now we also talk about the why. That's so, great. So I always talk about that. I um, There was a, a person I knew that used to work with me and she used to try to manage through emails, mm. you know, and try to basically that was her management technique. And me and my boss at the time were like, you can't manage through emails. You have to interact with people, right? Correct. You're not going to change people's hearts and minds through a piece of paper Correct. or a memo. I do a class on the seven steps to safety. Mm. And uh, one of the final steps that is often skipped over is you have to do a campaign. So after you've done your root cause analysis and you figured out what's caused and you've done your trending, your tracking, then you, and then you have to figure out a strategy to defeat the thing that's causing the safety problem, then you have to socialize it with all your employees, right? Yeah. That's what you're talking about, right? It is. Do a campaign, then you put out a memo, then you say, Correct. we're going to make this a policy. Yeah. You know, an example of that, when I came into Strathcona County, I believe in touch points. We have to have lots of touch points with our employees all along. And we all know in the transit industry, operators spend maybe 15, 20 minutes in the building, then they're all on their own. Right. So when I came in, our operators all reported to one person. So about 100 operators reporting to one person. We restructured, we changed that, and we had to report to our on road supervisors. So we had five of them, split them into 20. Now those guys have more touch points. Oh, that's they have good. A direct person they, lead, they report to, yeah. and they meet five minutes here or there, they right. touch points. Have those conversations. It gets away from that us against them. Yes. And, you know, when the inspector comes up, it's, oh, what did I do wrong? Because the only time I see you is when I'm doing something wrong. I'm going to call the principals. Now they come up, and the first few times, it's, what did I do wrong? Nothing. Just came to talk. Just want to see how you're doing. And they're building that relationship, and they're getting to understand, and they're getting to be people. Yeah. Not just a, a right. employee, employee and a number. Yeah, yeah. They're people. We get to yeah. know each other in that. And so it's really important, like you say. It's about connecting. It's about talking. Stats show that people want to hear from their frontline supervisor the most often. Yeah, they want to hear from me, and yeah. it's important that I com communicate to them, but they also want to hear from their frontline supervisor, their direct report. That's right. So how do we make those opportunities to happen more frequently? And so that's one of the things we're working on. We're, we're getting some success. We're, we gotta, we've come a long ways, but we've got a long ways to go still. Yeah. They say 70% of job satisfaction has to do with your relationship with your direct boss, yep. right? So that's what you're trying to do. Yep. Now, I think you also probably come to that with some authenticity and credibility since your career started as a bus washer and then a driver, right? It helps. So they know that you've had their job. I'm sure you've yep. let them know that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was funny when I came to Strathcona the first time. And uh, so my first day, I actually arranged. I knew the operations manager. And I said, I want to, to arrange. I want to be in the, in the operator's room when they come in in the morning at 5 o'clock and meet with them and say hi and that. And uh, <laughs> I ended up missing a uh, meeting with our city manager, commissioner, because I was supposed to meet him and we had mixed up in the buildings so we were to meet at. <laughs> so I felt like, oh no, my first day I blew off the boss. And uh, all I heard afterwards though was, he couldn't believe it that I came in at five o'clock in the morning and he told our mayor that and she couldn't believe it. And the first thing I heard when I met her was, I couldn't believe it. You were out. I heard you out at 5:30 in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, meeting with the operator. I said, "Well, that's transit. That's what we do." Right. Yeah, that's we good. Gotta meet, man. We got to meet our operators and our staff in their place. Yep. You know, and I, I, I have spent uh, time with our fuelers at night, going out and watch and being with them on their shift and that. These guys appreciate it. We can't have them come to ours. We got to go to them. And we got to meet them at what they're doing and understand what they're doing. Put ourselves in their place for a while just to have that understanding and appreciation. And then we can relate better with them. And they respect us more for it. Yeah. So you and Debbie 
Dalva Dove are two of the CEOs here in Canada that both kind of worked their way up from drivers. That's a rarity. What what drew you to working in transportation? Did you just fall into it, or how did it, how'd that happen? <laughs> yeah, actually, I did fall into it. <laughs> my father-in-law was a truck driver, and I kept telling him, you should get off the road and go drive city transit in Saskatoon at the time. And then at one point, uh, I was uh, young. I was uh, in my early 20s. My wife and I had uh, two kids already, and I was working retail, wasn't getting paid a lot. And he told me, hey, there's a job. The city's uh, hiring for people to clean buses. You should apply. So I thought, what the heck? And so I did it. And ah. I got it. And, and when you're in there, you are you either go down the mechanical route and, right. or you go in the operations. Well, I'm not mechanically inclined. So I went the operations route and got into driving. And it's just That's good. taking opportunities that came. And here's where I'm at. I started in the industry in 87. When did you start? What year did you start? Uh, I started in 87. Is that right? Yeah. My first day on the job was August 10th, 1987. Do you remember what June you were... 22nd. Is that right? Yep. So you've got me by a couple months. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So uh, tell us about your system some, you know, kind of like uh, all the stats. Okay. Well, we're a system. We have uh, 76 conventional buses. Uh, 24 of them are double-deckers, and the uh, rest are single-deckers, we call them. Yeah. Uh, we also have 13 uh, specialized transit buses. We are commuter service into Edmonton, but we also have our local service. And we're a specialized community, so in our specialized transit, we also service the rural community, which is a very large geographic area. I think it's 76,000 square feet. Kilometers. Oh, yeah. It's very. It's quite big. It's, it's bigger than the size of Edmonton itself as a city. Is it like flex routes you're running, or what are you doing no, there? No, just on demand for the specialized oh, okay. transit. All right. And we are, you know, looking at that potentially down the road. But right now, we just provide specialized transit in there. So uh, we have about 100 operators and a total staff of about 160 people. Uh, and it. Um, you have mechanics and all that too. We do, but the mechanics are managed by our fleet services. Okay. So they don't report to Because you're part of the city government. We're part of the city. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So who do you report to? Like the mayor? Uh, I report city to manager. an associate commissioner who reports to a chief commissioner and then to the mayor. Okay. So. So you're a commuter service. So you're taking a lot of people into Edmonton. That's a lot of what you do, I guess. Yeah, that's a predominant. Like we had uh, one, just under 1.7 million rides last year, and uh, like 1.3 of them are commuters into Edmonton. And back, so we take them to the downtown core and to the University of Alberta as our main two destinations. Okay, very good. Uh, but do you know about how many passengers a day you have on a weekday? It's about uh, three thousand trips a day, in yes. and out. Okay. Uh, so we have, uh, yeah, four, three to four thousand, about two thousand passengers a day. Yeah. Weekday. So what 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 big is happening in your world right now? Well, there's there's a lot. On, uh, we do a lot of regional collaboration. We're working with our regional partners, which is seven other transit systems. The big one being Edmonton, leading it on a smart bus, smart fare project. Okay, so bringing what's that? In a regional smart fare. So we can have the, everybody tap use on, the same. Tap on, account based. We're working on uh, some potential regional pass. Uh, yeah, Eddie Robar told me about that yeah, last night. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're act, I say pass. We're actually going into a pay as you go uh, fare fair capping. So instead of paying for your uh, pass up front, right. you can be paying on a weekly basis for those who are financially challenged. It's a lot more feasible. And if you don't, for some reason, use it for the whole month, then you save some money. Um, and it'll be distance based is what we're looking to go to. Yes, I heard that. You're going to yeah. do true, true distance based. True distance based. Yeah. That's yeah. good. So and you're going to try to make times. it neutral so it doesn't cost yeah, anybody we're more trying, money, Yeah, right? we're going to try and set it up so that your monthly cost will be the same as what you're doing now. So it's an exciting time. And with that, there's a base, which is uh, smart, uh, smart Bus, okay. which is Trapeze Transit Master. Oh, okay, It's the good. base of that. That also provides real-time information for our customers and next stop enunciations, the visual and the and the uh, digital. Right. Um, an audible, I mean. And so a lot of exciting stuff going on and uh, a lot of collaboration with uh, within our region and, and making transit the uh, best it can be in, in the Edmonton metro area. So you've got seven, like, separate operations now. We do. And so, are you chairman of some committee or something? No, I'm not chairman of any of, oh. in that aspect. I'm, I'm one of the members working. Uh, there's discussions right now on whether we should be amalgamating into one transit system in the metro area. And so that's some work going on right now. But as far as chairing anything, I'm very involved with CUDA, which we're at the conference here. Yeah. And I chair uh, a regional uh, portion that's, of that. Yes, that's what I was wondering yeah. about. So yeah. Tell me about that. For CUDA, I chair a region, which is the provinces of Manitoba, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, plus the territories of Yukon and the Northwest Territories. So it's a regional app. We have uh, 28 uh, 
transit systems in that area. The majority of them are in Alberta. We have 18 of them here. And we meet twice a year and, and meet and have a day and a half of roundtable discussions on all the trends and options and things going on. And uh, then we also have a, a workshop once a year for our frontline supervisors in the maintenance and in the specialized transit and conventional transit. Uh, we're one of the most active of the CUDA That's exciting, chapters. yeah. And we move our, our meetings around to the different uh, municipalities, like from Winnipeg um, uh, and is our farthest uh, west. Okay, and then, yeah. uh, or east, I guess, and then we, uh, you know, Alberta, we also then go up to Whitehorse and have some meetings because they're part of our uh, our chapter. And okay. That. So it's a great diverse, it's a big that area. That is good. And you, so it sounds like your association is really hands-on. So this is a CUDA thing, right? It's CUDA. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Um, I'm not... I'm not aware of that happening where it's like regional committees in America where they have, you know, as part of some of our associations where they do that. Yeah. That's, a, that's really good. It is. And, it, and yeah. like I say, we are one of the most active in uh, Ontario. They they do some stuff and they also work with Opta, the American Public Transportation Association. Yeah. Ontario, not America. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ontario, yeah. Slip of the tongue there. Right. Um, but uh, so there's different pockets in that. But, you know, we've been had a long history here in the, in the prairies of doing this and, okay. and uh, having some really, really good meetings and discussions about what's going on and building it's networking again right and building relationships and spending some quality time with our our colleagues and, and in the best area. practices and all yeah. that jazz right yeah that's what this this show is all about yeah. spreading some of our best practices tell me about your funding and how you get funded and you know what your fare box recovery ratio is that kind of stuff okay we have a budget that's about well our, our total expenses and that are about 23 million offset about 5 million in revenue so we have a budget of about 18 17 18 million um, funded uh, about 30% from the fare box uh, and advertising and other things uh, in revenue, and then the rest about 70% from the uh, tax base from the municipality. So is it is it have to be appropriated every year in the city budget, or yeah. do you have a dedicated funding source? No, that's okay. it. We get it's either tax base or revenues, advertising, and uh, fare box, and and so yeah, it's an annual budget. We go through the process every year, and uh, and you, you get a little increase every year. Not necessarily. Actually, you know, I've been I've been there for four years, and we've been doing a lot of stuff and looking for efficiencies. And and since I've been there for four years, our budget's only gone up by maybe about six hundred thousand. Okay. Uh, but we've been finding some efficiencies and making some changes, do some yeah. hard reviews, and, and 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 finding some of those things. And during that time, we've taken on a number of expenses too, because we've been bringing in the smart fare and the smart bus and getting ready for that. So we've added expenses, but we've also found some efficiencies to offset. Anything you could talk that. about? Like any stories you could tell about efficiencies you found that may be of interest to other people of well, was, medium-sized systems like yeah, yours? It was just looking at what we're doing and coming in from, uh, again, I've spent, uh, this is my fourth different uh, system I've worked in and looking at how we do business and where some areas. We had some retirements coming up and I saw that there was some capacity within some of the roles. So I amalgamated some and, and uh, reduced some of the staff. and Through attrition. Through attrition. Yeah, was, we've right. never laid anybody off and we've never do that. Look to that. Uh, it was like just efficiencies as we go. And so, you know, we uh, I took up uh, somebody from our planning department and scheduling. I combined their jobs and I took my must, uh, marketing customer service person and I had a supervisor of the customer service area and I amalgamated those together and we're finding a lot more efficiencies and and uh, also streamlining some things so it makes things flow a little easier. So it's just a matter of constantly looking and seeing and also part of what helps with that is seeing what other systems are doing. Right. And you know, you go somewhere and you see what, oh, that's what they're doing. Okay, how could we maybe make that? That, that seems to work. How does it work out? And we, and we've had a consulting firm uh, work with us and uh, come in and do an org review. And, and who's and, that consulting firm? Uh, it was Dylan Consulting, and oh, okay. uh, they've done some good work for us. And they came in and they did an org review, and kind of we said, here's where we are now, and here's where we, here's the optimal, and here's some steps to get there. So again, it wasn't like okay, we're just changing everything overnight. We're gonna as through attrition and through these things, we'll make these steps at the right time and get to this end goal. And we're about uh, 85% towards that right now in four years. Wow. In getting there, we've got a couple more steps to go. And uh, what are those steps? What are you doing uh, for the future? Well, just how we look at our training. Um, okay. We've got some things going on in there, and and there's some people there that uh, you know um, are providing some great service for us. But as we uh, when they are going to retire, then we're going to look at how that position is, and can we look at it in a different way, and what what the skill sets for that do, and and so again, that's some stuff. And then there's. There's always some other things you're always looking at yeah. and tweaking in that. So. so do you have a board? 
No, I just okay. report uh, okay. within. We're uh, just a department within the municipality. Gotcha. Yeah, that's good. And so I guess as a result of that, though, you are really connected in with the community and in touch with what the community wants for the system. Yeah, well, and actually interesting because uh, we just finished and had our new transit master plan approved in February of this year. And through that, we did a lot of public consultation, about a year and a half of working, again, with our consulting firm, Dylan, and uh, and uh, out engaging the public. We went out in two phases and, and, and uh, got their feedback and then came back uh, about eight months, 12 months later and said, here's what we heard, did we get it right? And if we didn't, where did we miss? And honest truth, uh, they were really supportive. And the big thing that came out of that, one of the uh, transitional things we're gonna be doing is looking at on-demand uh, service in some of our areas where the service is, uh, Either the demand is low or the, the density isn't there. And one of the first areas we're going to look at is our evenings and weekends where it really is not a good service. Um, you can walk faster from some areas than you can take the bus. It just it, because, because the frequency is so low? Frequency, is that what you mean? It's an yeah. hour and they're fixed route meandering through all these areas. Yeah, and, yeah. And that. So it just doesn't work. So we're going to look at the on-demand and, and uh, come up with something like that that, again, be more efficient but more effective for our right. residents, get them where they need to be quicker. And then based on that pilot and the success from that, what we want to do is then look at where can we do that somewhere else. We want to move into more mobility management. Okay. It's about meeting the right need, right sizing, right vehicle, the right for the right service, the right time, the right area. And your focus is on what you and I were talking about before we recorded this, which is the end customer, sounds like. Yes. You're not focused on, okay, hey, we've always run buses, we're just going to continue to run buses, and but can I look at this differently? Are you including other players, Uber, Lyft, and any other companies in that role? Or we're, Yeah, we're definitely okay. going to be reaching out. At the start, when we do a pilot, uh, we'll probably do a lot of it in-house, but how do we engage the, the right people in the right place? Because, you know, sometimes it's better to have a, somebody else do it for you because they can do it more effectively than we mm -hmm. can and that so that's part of it it's going to be an evolution it's we're going to be trying this and okay this will works but not quite then what's the next one mm -hmm. and it's like i say it's that right sizing the right fit the right time and uh how do we find that so it's, it's trial and error yeah but you got to start somewhere and we know that uh the on-demand is going to be the right uh, uh service and in our evenings and weekends and then you know, I anticipate when we have a new area open up, that's how we'll start the service in there. Okay. And we're going to look at midday where, again, the demand goes down. Is there areas where that can work? So you so, would be looking for people, instead of running a route, they would go online or call a reservations office and book a trip or use an app? Yeah. App will be there, but there'll always be the ability to call. Because, yeah. again, we have to realize not everybody using, else is Is that where you're using the TripSpark stuff that you were saying earlier? Um, that's just for a specialized right okay, now. Okay, all right, yeah. Um, but, you know, that's we're looking at all options that yeah. can do that for us. So, the, so uh, instead of running a bus way out into some neighborhood, Mrs. Smith can now go on an app or call a phone and say, could you pick me up at 2.30 and you'll have somebody there? Is that the game plan? That's the, well, Even if she's not uh, a person with a disability or no, elderly? No, and we're looking for conventional operations okay, yeah. on demand. And again, yeah, in areas, like especially in our evening, again, we'll go back. Yes. And, you know, we don't have a lot of demand, but we have service industry people that work late. That's right. They need to get home. Yeah. And so right now they're taking an hour on the bus and we can have the on demand. They can get home in 10, 15 minutes again, wow. like we talked earlier. Yeah. And they have time with their family. Right. They, and, and stuff. It, it, and so how do we do that? How do we get that? And so, yes, app based or call in and, and uh, you'll say uh, on the app, I need to be picked up and it might be a 10 minute window. It might be a 20. We're mm -hmm. working through that. Uh, but it's not waiting for that fixed bus. It's coming in 50 minutes. And then it takes you more directly home and saves you a lot of time. Right. If you ever get a chance, you want to listen to the um, our Transit Unplugged episode called Flex Denmark. Okay. So I went to Denmark and visited with these guys in uh, Phenomenal. Very similar to you. So Denmark is not a very big country. And they mm -hmm. have five major cities. And they have figured out basically a way to do a nationwide microtransit co-op where they all help each other. And they've outsourced it all. Any fixed routes that weren't hitting certain standards, they got rid of them and went to demand response. Yeah. They just are very methodical about it. They have numbers they look for. Mm. If it doesn't hit certain standards, you don't do the route, you don't do the fixed route, you just do on demand. Yeah. And they outsource that to even down to mom and pops who are running their own cars, picking people up. And it, it works for them. And it's, yeah. it's interesting when you talk about your regional approach, they've also, uh, they have five major cities, and at nights and weekends, they roll up everything to one call center. Mm. So one call center controls everything for the five cities because there's not enough work. So if you do some kind of regional thing, that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Where can we synergize and cooperate? Right. Yeah, and, and again, you know, 
even before the regional discussions to, uh, on a potential commission, the Edmonton metro area does a lot of collaboration. You know, we've got a U-Pass. It's a it's a regional U-Pass. We're working on the smart fare, and we have uh, um, sharing agreements for us to use stops in Edmonton. There's been a great working relationship in the region. And then again, on the CUTA side, when we go to our chapter meetings or we come to conferences like this, we're always talking with each other because... You know, Airdrie, just north of here, is a small community. They've done a ride share already. So we're all learning from him. We're listening to what, what Chris there has to say and his learnings, his, mm-hmm. his good experiences, his bad experiences. And then we're able to make changes based on what we're going to do. So a lot of collaboration, a lot of networking, yeah. a lot of sharing. And, That's and good. That's the great I thing. see that across Canada. A lot of it's your systems great. are doing that. I mean, we were with Kevin Desmond last night. He was telling Eddie, you know, I'm looking to what you're doing with electric buses mm-hmm. uh, because he's got, I guess, 40 now proteres he bought or something. Yep. And they're, they're going to see how that works in the cold environment and longer routes and that kind of stuff. And so it's great when you learn from each other, right? Well, in Edmonton is learning from St. Albert, which is on the other side of Edmonton. Okay. St. Albert has had uh, has seven electric buses in their 56 bus fleet already that they've been having in service for over two years in this environment and of learning lots of things that, again, yeah. they're sharing with us. So, yes, in the Canadian transit family, we share. Like I say, I can call up my friend Judy in, in St. John's and say, hey, Judy, this is going on. I hear you're doing this, and, and what can you tell me? And we have a conversation or we connect at a, right. at a conference. Uh, it, it, it's one big family. That's and great. We we share with each other. We always say, don't reinvent the wheel. If somebody else is working on it, let's share it and let's figure it yeah. out. Somewhere down the road, they're going to be doing that for you. So we work together really well. It's a great family relationship up here. What else can you tell me about what's coming next for for this region and for your operation? Well, for our operations, again, we're this all the regional work coming on, and uh, we're our smart fair will be. Uh, uh, launched uh, next year, a pilot is we're looking to do that in the spring, and then it'll, it'll be about a year until we're fully transitioned. So that's an exciting time, and it's going to be a lot of a lot of work. It's good work. It's going to be excellent for our uh, riders and our passengers, and the things they're getting. The smart uh, bus, where Edmonton already has a smart bus up and, and running, but we're going to get it. And, uh, we hope it's up and running in January so our customers can uh, s- stay in their warm house or they're at the university campus and not go out to that bus stop where they have to sit and wonder right. if the bus is coming. Uh, they can time it and say, I need, it takes me five minutes to walk, the bus is 10 minutes away, okay, I'm going to go now. And they're not sitting out in January in minus 30 right in there. So that's an exciting thing and I know yeah. a lot of our uh, passengers are looking forward to that. Um, again, working on our master plan with our dynamic transit for us. The regional conversations, um, I'm, I honestly don't know where they're going to go. There's, right. there's a lot of... Well, it's a conversation, right? We'll see where it goes. It's yeah. a conversation, and, it, and if it goes, it happens. But if not, I still have a lot of confidence because we, we're a very close-knit group up there, and we do a lot of sharing. We have a lot of collaboration going on. And I think even with what's going on, if it doesn't materialize into a commission... Uh, we're learning some things that we can take and even work together as partners up there and, and see if we can flesh some of them out and make them work. So it's a great time to work up there. On the CUTA level, there's just so much going on. Uh, again, you've met Marco. Marco's uh, yes. just over a year Marco into his job yeah. in here, and he's got some exciting stuff. Um, in the, our region, we're doing some... Uh, lobbying with the provincial government here and uh, just trying to build relationships with them as they've done on a national level, trying to help them understand the benefits that public transit can bring to them. We just had a budget came out that was not necessarily a a good budget because mm-hmm. unfortunately there's some uh, revenue spending issues they I heard they about depend that. upon yes. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know, and we've had some funding for public transit cut out of that, but it's like, okay, you wanna you wanna get the economy rolling again? Well, we can help you with that. Let's, yeah. Let's sit down and have a conversation. We can we can help you, and here's what we can do, and uh, we can assist you in that. So, how do we work together? So we just again we're in initial stages, but it starts with uh, a conversation. That's right. And building a relationship, and uh, you know, it, it'll build from there, and so. We're doing that, and that's some exciting stuff. Um, it'll be our first time. We're doing a, a day at the Alberta Legislature on November 26th, okay. first time ever. And uh, we're hoping that'll become a tradition. And then because yeah. we do the region, we want to start doing the same kind of thing in their adjacent province of Saskatchewan. And okay. I'm working with them and getting them to start because um, public transit isn't to the level there as it is here in Alberta. We're, we're fortunate with Edmonton, Calgary, and the LRTs. Yeah. It gets attention, but they don't have that in, in Saskatchewan. So how do we get that government uh, starting to think about public transit? So 
some well, exciting times. Yeah. Well, the last question I want to ask you is one that would be unique for you, Wade, and that's because you worked your way up from being a bus driver and a driver all the way up. And we have a lot of listeners who work in the industry but aren't in management yet. Right. And they're in lower, lower uh, manual jobs. I don't want to call them lower, but manual jobs, yeah. not management jobs. Talk to them for a minute and talk to them about career pathing and, and you know, how they might want to see their career go. If they, There's nothing wrong with staying a mechanic. No, Believe me, we no. need mechanics. Yeah. <laughs> I know across the industry we're yeah. short, but maybe somebody wants to move up into management. What would be some advice you might give them? I think the best advice I can say is Always look for opportunities, and, and some of those initial opportunities is volunteering for committees and getting involved. Because what it does is it helps to broaden your perspective of things. You you don't you see it in a different way, and so that's what I did. I was involved in some committees within that, and then I took opportunities when they came uh, and got involved with training as an operator. Just took advantage of opportunities, made myself available, let people know I was interested in learning more. I went and talked to the managers or supervisors and said, Hey, you know, I, I'd like to do this, and yeah, and what, took initiative. How, how do I get there? And what, what are some of the things that can position me for that? So, yeah, it's you, you need to let people know. But, you know, I think the biggest thing is just uh, you got to invest. And sometimes that's your own time and through committees and volunteering. And then that started it for me. Yes. And people started to see that. And they say, oh, he's willing to do something. It's not he's just looking for, hey, give me a position. You know, he's putting in the time to, to get to know the system and give some of his time in. I know that helped me get to where I was. I'm That's at good. Now. And then obviously you have to do your current job well, probably, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You have to be a good employee mm-hmm. and uh, they have to, you know, because nobody's going to promote a bad employee. Right. So, right. so, yeah, you have to be good at what you're doing and, you know, you have to love what you're doing. You won't do a good job if you don't love what you're doing. So make sure you're in the right industry, in the right job. Yep, that's good. That's a great. We kind of come full circle because we both we started out this conversation about the, where our passion comes from, and yeah. it comes because we love our job because of what it does for people, yeah, right? We're helping people. Uh, we're making their lives better. Yeah. Thank you. So, Very thank good, you. Wade. It's a pleasure. Appreciate, yeah. Nice meeting you, and it's yeah. a great interview. And I wish you all the best of luck as you continue to improve the lives of thousands of people in your region every day. Thank you. You've been listening to Transit Unplugged, powered by Trapeze Group. To stay up to date, subscribe on iTunes or Google Play, or join the conversation at transitunplugged.com. Thanks for listening.